Good evening everyone, how you all doing? How's all good over there? And let's see who's lurking. Uh, so yes, good evening to Pondipim, Shimera and Tum Dum and Wind Up Boy. Also to uh, Trash Talk. Twitch is telling me that you're not in the chat, but I can see that you are here. So, hey. Um, the, uh, the audio and video is apparently working well, which is great. And yes, I am first off, sorry I was AWOL last week. I am, um, I was, I got sick, like strep throat or something stupid like that. Just, uh, yeah, I was, I, I will have been asleep at the time that the last stream was on. And I'm kind of here now. I'm very tired. But other than that, I'm alright. I'm just, uh, yeah. We'll see if this one ends up on YouTube. Also, talking of YouTube videos, super sorry that those haven't gone up. There's two of them sitting there. They needed the fronts trimmed off and then just to be put up, but I just haven't been, yes, I haven't been coached for a while. Um, ghost protocol is functioning as intended. Um, more important, streaming lies. Um, right. So today is kind of a casual stream. It's not been announced on any of the normal places I announce it. Um, I just fancied getting back into the rhythm of doing this because it felt annoying to be away. And so, yeah, I'm going to pour caffeine into my head and I'm going to look at some bugs and just hang out with you folks. And so yeah, if anything's going on or that I will have missed, yell it out. I'm kind of interested in what's happening in the lispy space or anything else for that matter. So yeah, let's just take it as a chill one and we'll just uh, do some stuff. So I'll start rambling away as I normally do and we'll see what we've got. So what I really wanted to do is do some small issues uh, that kind of, and just have a look at some stuff and see where we are. So there's stuff like this. I mean, this is this is trivial. So um, some of the types have not been exposed, uh, apparently. So let's go and have a look at this and just see what else is in there. I'm never I, these types were added into Kevl very early on, and I don't like them. Um, ideally, I'd move them out to their own package. Um, that feels like something I should do in general, actually. But here we go. There's one of them. So let's just see which of these aren't exposed. And I haven't got my uh, chat on this machine, the machine that's in front of me, but I do have it over to my right. So I've got to be, remember to look over at you. We still haven't done the bell, of course. That is a theme. Uh, so let's delete anything that doesn't match Deathstruct. Um, and those will be the types that need to be ex uh, exported. So let's go check the package and see what's there. Uh, so G, P, and T, and things like this. Here are some types. Um, well, I can see this one and this one. I can definitely see this one and this one. I can see this one and this one. I can't see any of them mentioned, mentioned B. Um, in fact, none of them that mention B are there. Okay, so we kind of want to export those. Um, oh no, wait. So we actually exported all the one, the B ones for all the accessors. Um, we haven't exported the constructors or the name itself. Okay, so let's do this. Um, let's do this and... Okay, and then we should be done. So now I can go over here, say make... Oh, what should we do? Uh, make C array. Um, initial content is going to be nil and the dimensions are going to be 10 and the element type is going to be... Um, what's it going to be? Uh, G, P, N, T, B. And that's there. Cool. So that's now exported. So that's the first one down. Um, let's go and... Yeah, let's commit this. Um, what is that B for anyway? Oh, um, that will be ones with bitangent, I expect. What am I... Why am I suspecting? Let's just go find out. Um, yeah, by tangent. Export uh, predefined uh, GPU structs with by tangent. And, whoops, 
What have I done? Ah. Okay, then let's just do this. Let's get that pushed. Oh yeah, and we want to look at that last one and um, say, okay, fixed in this. Nice. That one down, cool. Actually, there was something else mentioned that I should have checked. Um, Oh no, this was a unrelated thing that wasn't actually an issue, it was a user error, but that is no problem. Cool, all right. Um, let's have a look. Inc like, so increment of vector component complains that user is trying to assign into float. Oh yeah, that's a Vario bug. If I close the... Uh... Yeah, let's just load up Capital again and look at its issues. <laughs> Stash's name fault. Yeah, there's there's plenty of that kind of stuff around. It's the 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 nice bit of when you're uh, your own projects, <laughs> you kind of just have some have mess that you can't really tolerate at work. I'm not saying that my uh, Tailspire experiments branch is any better, but um, yes. Okay, uh, this is a too big a one for today. I actually need to be able to think to do this one. It comes down to uh, one of the restrictions, one of the ways we ask people to define um, UBOs and SSBOs in Keppel is we say, hey, if you define a struct first, we'll use that as the layout of your SSBO or whatever. And um, that has some ramifications, which is kind of annoying. We need to look into that. Um, it might be fine. It might not be, but again, I need to be cogent for this. Uh, could setters generated by make typed from foreign have typed values? I don't know. What does that mean? Um, oh, we've got some users of safety zero. Okay, if we're going to be looking at safety stuff, um, that's almost certainly wrong if there's safety zero in there. There's a few places, but if it's anything user facing, then it shouldn't be safety zero. Okay, so with GPU array as C array can't be nested. Again, that's an interesting one because that's down to map it like what we can bind. Okay, so we actually had a look at this before. Uh, Geon map buffer. So it makes the uh, memory or the data at least um, in a GPU buffer makes that available locally, so you can get a pointer to it and you can do stuff with it. Um, and you bind it to a target, so it's either array buffer or element array buffer. One of these four, anyway. Now, if you're binding it to one of these. Um, that means you can only bind, bind one of you can only bind to one of these at a time, right? So that causes issues if we were to write something like uh, with GPU array as C array. Oh yeah, array as C array. Come on, don't use autocomplete. Just type it. Um, C0, and so we have one GPU array and we bind it, one GPU array in G0 and we bind it to C0. Oh cool, now I actually want another one as well. Cool, so I'll just, I've got two GPU arrays. This suggests I can just nest it like this. And then I could say copy data between the mem copy, um, some data from C1 to C0, whatever, like something, something there. But this isn't actually valid. Um, unless these two are bound to separate targets. So what I could do is say that the, oh, do I actually give you an option to pick the target? It doesn't look like I do, which is pretty bad. Um, so that might be another thing as well. Uh, let's have a look actually. It seems like um, map buffer range. Okay, with buffer range mapped, we, we seem to expose target. Um, let's look, just look at GL. Let's see what we've got around here. All right. Map. Map buffer range. Okay, that's what we always use. Looks like it. 
with GPU array range as pointer. Uh, with buffer, yeah, okay. And target is. Okay, so we have a target uh, keyword for with GPU array with GPU array range as pointer with GPU array range as C array with GPU array as C array. We don't use the target setup here. We don't expose it, but we totally could. Let's do that. So let's just take, let's bring this up so we can actually see what we're doing. Okay, so this one with GPU array as pointer has an argument for target. Um, let's go down here with GPU array as C array and add the same deal here. Um, I hate this stuff. Right, okay, so temp name, GPU array, and then the keyword arguments. Um, whatever, that'll be fine. Um, and so now we have the target. And now we can use this here, which will be um, target is target. Okay, so what this would mean is that down when we jump over to REPL and I see things going on. Um, Trash Talk saying, how do you do strong typing in Lisp? You don't really have um, strong typing because there's a lot of, because of how dynamic everything is, it's, it's just not something you can do. But you are able to um, provide type information, well, type declarations. They're a little different from a type um, from types in other, like the way you define type signatures in other languages. And the, and the difficulty is you're basically telling the compiler, you're saying, hey, I know this about this situation. And so not only is the compiler not obliged to use it because Lisp could be interpreted, and it doesn't really make sense to do all those checks during interpretation time, it's not obliged to use that information. It isn't obliged to validate the information. Um, if you tell the compiler, hey, this in this situation, this is a float, it is perfectly legal for it to just believe you. Now, saying that, a lot of the compilers are smart enough, or at least SBCL is very much smart enough to do a lot of checking, and we'll find cases where you have... Um, if, you, if you write something which doesn't make sense, like, oh, you've declared something to be here, but that completely contradicts with how you're using it here, it'll raise errors. But there's still plenty of things that will go through silently. Um, in general, let's just... Uh, I'm just going to check something here. Let's just see... Uh, target, let's just use element buffer, because I just want to see this, uh, if this is going to work. It expands, and it now passes element buffer along to target. We expand this, and that has with mapped buffer to element buffer there. That expands, and you can see a call to map buffer, uh, where the first argument, target, is coming from here element buffer. Now it is kind of unfortunate actually that given that given that it had this keyword right here and this macro knows that it's going to be passing it. If it could see that it's a keyword why not just do the enum conversion at that point so you don't have to have the enum look up at runtime. That might be something we want to optimize in future. Okay so there's a few things. Let's write that down. Um, Blah. Um, okay, so do, 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 do. Um, could inline um, you know, could um, do enum conversion at compile time when uh, keyword is inline. Um, um, bit of work at runtime. 
So this will be an enhancement, and it's something we can look at later. But it's also a nice little issue, so maybe we'll have a look at it today. Um, some people watching might be going, is it really that expensive to do the enum lookups? It's not that it's that expensive. It's that if you get a lot of them, um, they really do add up. Um, in fact, a lot of optimizations that were done inside Keppel did boil down to me finding lots of places that I could um, replace. Like, I, I was getting a significant amount of time being spent converting enum keywords into enum values. And doing that as early as possible did save time. Um, why do I keep closing this? Go there. Right, okay, so to your question, which because it was a very interesting one, it was on what uh, you can do type-wise. Let's just, um, let's bring up a little file. There's foo.lisp. There's no way there's not a foo there already exactly. Okay, let's do foo2. Um, what was it, that one? All right. Um, okay, so we were going to be talking about type type stuff. Type type. Um, can you return? You can just tell a pilot that function foo should return an integer. Yes, absolutely. So defund foo. Uh, there's a couple of places we can um, specify some types. So the first thing we can do is we can declare things uh, within a scope. Um, you can say locally um, and then add some declarations if you want to declare things within a lexical scope. Um, you can also add a declare at the top of, I can't remember what the, de what the terminology is for where you can use declare, but if you check up on the hyperspec, it's gonna tell you that um, where it can be used. It can occur in a lambda expression or in any of the forms listed in the next figure. So this is one of the places where you can stick a declare after. So what we're gonna do here is we're gonna say that the type um, integer of x. So we're expecting that x is going to be an integer. And now we're saying that x and y are going to be integers. And we're going to do add x and y for the return. Now, that doesn't let us um, declare the return type explicitly. Well, another thing you can do is you can say the integer um, and an expression. So this is saying you're declaring the, the uh, type of what this will evaluate to. So that's one thing there. Again, it's not... Um, exactly what you're asking for though. So what I would do here, I would say is declaim. And now we're gonna make a bunch of top level declarations. Um, and these are used at compile time. I won't go into exactly when, um, but yeah. So we can say, we're gonna declare the function type of foo. No, wait a second, the name comes last. So the function type, function, integer, integer, oops. To integer foo. We compile this, we compile this, and um, yeah, that's it. That tells it that these are the types. I wish I could explain it better. Let's see what's going on in here. Um, that's kind of all the typing I really need that's super useful. Um, why not boys just uh, first time back after the haircut? Yeah, it's been a, it's been savage, sir. It's, and I've got this kind of saddle shape in it right now because I wear headphones all day, which is super great when I forget, like just, you know, walk out of her house and just look like a Muppet. Well, look up like a Muppet in the hair department as well as everywhere else. Okay, so <coughs> to um, trash talk, one of the other things you could do is maybe make yourself a little macro. Um, DFT fun for def typed fun. And then we're going to say name, and we're going to say args, and we're going to say return uh, type, and we're going to, let's call these type args. And then you're going to have a body, which is body. Um, let's do this. And then maybe let's take this and generate some code in a macro. And so as a really dirt simple version, let's just say we're going to map car the second from typed arg. So the, the, every argument is going to be a pair of a name and a type. Um, obviously, this is going to mean we can't use most things in, la, in uh, la, a Lambda list. So you would want to expand this macro into something decent. It's something I've done. Plenty of people have done, but I've also done in some of my projects. I'm going to do the return type. We're going to have the name of the function here, name here. Um, Let's do um, loop 
for name type in type targs. Um, oops. Collect. I don't know. So we're going to do, we're going to be declaring a type, type, name, and then body. And now if you write deft fun, we can write foo, and we can say x is an integer, and y is an integer, and the return type is an integer. Let's move that down to a nice new line because it just looks cool. And then we can say plus x, y. And if we expand this macro, then you can see we've got our declaim. Uh, for foo, and we've got foo itself along with the type declarations for our um, arguments. And that works. So, that will be one way you can use this. I would actually advise going and reading up on this kind of stuff, but it is fairly interesting, and SBCL can do some very cool things with it. Um, when it knows the types, there's lots of places it can do optimizations. Um, I wonder if we can see an example where we can do something wrong that it'll catch. Um, let's say string here. Um, okay, so you can see here, first it's complaining that a star warning, um, that the f-type proclamation has changed. So we've just changed the signature of this. So I'm going to compile it again so that is uh, gone. And we'll see we're left with the other issue. It's saying, hey, look, I've looked at this type, and um, given that this is an integer and an integer, there is no way that saying, say the derived result of this is an integer, right? Um, which conflicts with the idea that you've said that it's a string. So that's one of the cases where it can do those kinds of checks. And it can do it in some fairly complex ways, but it's not something you can... <clears throat> Sorry, I need to drink. That's really interesting. I thought my throat was doing okay, and now talking a lot, I've realized I am not well yet. Um, but yes, um, it's not something you can rely on in the same way that you can rely on it in other languages. You don't have those guarantees. Uh, but what's there is interesting. So, I mean, if you want an example, well, I'm going to say it's a good example, but um, if you go to RTG Math, you can find a place where I have been using types a lot. So if we go to any of these, almost all of these are typed. So if I look at the consing ones, you can see I've got my own little macros because the declarations can be fairly interesting. Like here we're defining that this function should be inlined. Um, and again, we've got a very similar thing, right? We've got some arguments that are single floats. It's returning a vector three, the name of the function. We're saying that this function's inline. We've got the declarations inside. Um, <coughs> um, why is it got why is it saying make itself is inlined? I guess to, if it was a recursive function, that's a bit squirrely, but okay. Um, but yes, that kind of thing. So yeah, check it out. But this can be really useful and does make a big difference in the kind of code that uh, SBCL especially can generate. I wonder if there's a good example of this. Probably not when we're using... Um, So let's do defund baz um, x and y and plus x and y. This is going to be a dodgy example, but let's look at it anyway. So let's say a single float and a single float and a single float. Um, and let's call this baz. And then lastly, we're going to do defund um, test zero. All right, and we're just going to do another declaration here. We're going to declare that we want to optimize for speed. Um, and let's do that in these two. I'm trying to think of the best way to do this. It's a kind of, hmm. Okay, so in this case, uh, when I've said I want to optimize this function for speed, it's going, hey, look, you've asked us to optimize for speed, but I'm having to do a generic uh, addition because I'm unable to prove any of these conditions. Like if both of these were double floats, I could do some optimization. If both of these were single floats, I could do some optimization. But you've given me nothing to work with here. Whereas this one, like no warnings. Um, we'll do a quick thing and just see what we get from a disassemble. Um, 
So there isn't much here. We're just kicking straight out to this generic function, which is going to be slower because it's generic. Um, whereas something like this, we're going to see something slightly longer, um, but we're also going to be getting um, a direct call to the... Um, I mean, this is a SIMD function, but it's taking a single float from both of these SIMD registers. Um, but yeah, that's the kind of stuff. It can do different things when you get information. That was a nice distraction. I like that. Um, Bag is it saying it may be a little bits of Lisp video, right? Um, if not already done, I could do that. It's one of those things. So when it comes to types, I there's quite a bit there, and if I was going to do it, I want to obviously I want to say something I absolutely know, and as you can tell from how I'm talking about it right now, a lot of this stuff isn't concrete in my head. Um, I know enough to be dangerous, and that's about it. But yeah, it would be really good to do. Um, I wanted to really understand when we get up to a lot of these top level forms. Um, it, I really want to be able to understand the evaluation order of everything, and that m means having a good understanding of like eval when and things like this um and yeah that gets really interesting i was starting to write a um an episode based on how code is loaded compiled and stuff like that in in less according to the standard um but that was ooh, that was a lot of reading to do ah oh, but i really want to do that one because it's one that's been fuzzy in my head forever let's leave foo two for a second hey indigo good to see you down there Right, so what are we doing? What, what what did we get to? We just did some other stuff, didn't we? Um, yeah, <coughs> we can now provide the target um, explicitly for with GPU array as C array, which is slightly better. Let's do that. Um, add target um, key arg for with GPU array as C array. Good. Um, don't worry about that for now. Let's get back to these issues. Let's see what else is going on. Um, Lumi's saying, yes, a list stream, just what I've been looking for. Hello, Lumi. Welcome. Um, I've mostly used Clojure and Racket myself, so and, and not much CL. Time to learn the differences. Ask questions. I'm happy to talk about whatever, because today is... Um, I'm streaming because I wanted to be streaming, but I'm not entirely well, so I'm not doing anything important. So, um, yeah, this is the perfect stream for us to have distractions like the one Trash Talk just took us on, which was great. Um, Wind Up always says, I've been following along, but on YouTube, that's really cool. And I'm sorry I didn't put out the uh, episodes, the latest episodes on YouTube yet. I really should have. That is going to come. Right, okay, so what else have we got in here? Let's just go through and open a few that we can look at. So yeah, this is a problem. This is something we're gonna have to, to deal with. And that was what we were looking at a second ago, which is the fact that if you nest them, they're gonna try and use the same target, which is a problem because the from the code point of view, it looks like um, the code, the way you write it down syntactically makes it look like um, it's perfectly fine to nest them, and it's not. And so at the very least, we need to give decent warnings, um, or decent errors, and um, in general, we actually just need to do better. So I'm not sure what we're going to do there yet. <coughs> God damn, why is my throat so dry? It's because you're not well, boy. Okay, don't register a function whose signature is invalid. This one's very useful. Um... So normally when we have a GPU function, um, there are cases where you've got a file with a bunch of GPU functions and they kind of call each other. Like you're not allowed a recursion in um, in GLSL. Um, but I didn't want it to have to be defined. I didn't want you to have to have like header files and everything to be defined in a certain order. So what I was doing was if there was a function that was missing, that was trying to call a function that wasn't there, it would just wait. It would leave its code there and say, I'm probably got something wrong, but I don't know. So I'll just hold out. And then the next function that compiles, if it's the one that was missing, it will then compile that earlier function. Um, the function that was missing, uh, the newer function. 
and that was really handy. So it would register the function to be cleaned up later, to be completed. Um, but we have this case where it was registering functions that are completely fucked, like you could write a completely nonsensical signature which will never be valid, and yet it was still registering that function for completion later. And that caused a lot of confusion because you would write something that's clearly wrong, and it would get registered. Then you'd, you'd fix it, and now both of these definitions exist because we have um, function overloading. So we have technically multiple versions of the same function, and it's trying to consider it at different times. Um, it's like, oh, you've typed in the like a call to the Jeff function. There's two versions of the Jeff function. One of them's irrevo irre irrevocably, irrevocably, broken. And so, um, yeah, that's a problem. We need to fix that. We just need to not register it. It's completely fucked. Um, indirect compute dispatch would be awesome. That's a, that requires brain cells, which I don't have today. Allow, attach a whole text. Oh, this is really cool. I should have a look at that just again because it's interesting. Make FBO with no arguments doesn't seem to work. That sounds interesting too. With blending is disabled. It's disabled. Stabling blending at end of scope rather than restoring. Oh, that's fucked. Okay, that's, that's very interesting. Yeah, that's going to take some attention, so I won't look at that now. Uh, change inlining strategy with FBO bound, clear attachments, and should support the none argument. The none attachment. Okay, we'll have to look at that later as well. Da da da, in with FBO. Okay, look into resizing GPU arrays. That's interesting. Assuming small values for. Don't know what that is. Oh, there's some problems with. Problems on Windows 10. I've been running on Windows 10. That's strange. I'll have to look into that. I know this is this is quite old. I uh, wasn't able to reproduce it then, but I should try harder. Um, potential make texture bug. That's interesting. Okay, let's start there. Let's have a quick look at Vario and see what we've got. I've got one here, which was this increment of vector. When we make a hidden temp variable, like in with slots, ah, this is the error that came up the other week on our stream. This would be great to fix this one. Um, add case statement with arms that return or discard look like they will produce incorrect type information. That's interesting, but sounds involved. Add support for image memory and format qualifiers, not today. Better type suggestions, that would be good. Let's open that up and see what's involved in that case. Um, Say to subroutine support, dear God, I don't think that I don't think I'm going to get to be able to support that with my current setup. I think Vario would have to change fairly significant for that to, significantly for that to work, unfortunately. Um, okay, well let's go with that for now. Let's see what we've got here. Um, here to go saying don't do warnings just put I dare you in there instead AK Grams here, hello welcome right so this is, okay so there's a couple here and this got a um, test case which is nice I was actually being a decent human being when I filed this okay this is a very interesting one but let's just have a quick look at this let's see how screwed up this is Doot. Okay, so, oops. All right, let's make ourselves a little place we can test things. Um, we're gonna go back to our foo, let's go foo three. Um, def package, no. Um, we're gonna use uh, Keppel and Vari and CL and RTG math and RTG math dot Vari to get the GPU stuff. Actually, shouldn't need that. That should just work as is, I think. Oh, you can't remove things now. Okay, fine. Fine, that'll be okay. Just use that. Let's see what we get then. Make sure I've got CL. Yes, good. All right, so we were going to test this. And there's the problem. Currently, Vario cannot handle changing the type through an assignment to this due to the static nature of GL. Place is a float, value is an int. Um, it's freaking out because 
Yes, because we've got this increment statement here. So it's incrementing this place. And this place is of type float. But inc f, its default um, value argument, the default value, it, default delta, there's the term I'm looking for, is the integer 1. So it's saying, oh, I can't do that because 1? That's kind of stupid, though, because, I mean, I can do this and I know it'll work. That's not a problem. But this shouldn't even be an issue. Because if we did set f this to be um, this plus 1 and the integer 1, it'll work fine because it knows that it can cast this straight to a float and everything is going to be okay. Um, that assignment looks weird. Why is it? Those brackets look odd. Is that valid? That looks a bit questionable to me. Hmm. Anything that's not that, Chris. Come on, try again. Okay. I still think that's a bit weird to do that at top level because I think the only thing that can be in blocks like that are statements, not expressions. And I would have thought that having it in parens made an, an expression. So there's some things we can do here for sure. Um, let's... Well, let's make a... Let's load Keppel.tests. While that's loading, let's go and find out where this code lives. Um, works, vario, source, vario.cl. Um, it's going to be probably special functions, and it's probably going to be assignment. And here's increment being defined as a macro that uses um, some other stuff inside. It uses a special form called modify place. Okay. So the problem is going to be with modify place itself. In fact, if we look here, we can see something that is comparing types and it has this assignment type match. And that is the error that we were getting. Currently, Vario cannot handle changing the type through. Let's, um, let's move this down to a new line. Um, actually, let's just, hmm. uh, it's not great. We'll have to, I really want to understand about how we can do word wrapping in errors better. It's just the presentation isn't very nice. Anyway, ignoring that, this is where that error is coming from. The fact that these types are not equal. But it's a little bit different when there's an operation like this involved. So the operation here is equals, and these ones are plus equals, minus equals, things like this. So in, in this one, it matters, right? This one, we can't do the implicit casting, I wouldn't have thought, um, or we wouldn't want to do it. Whereas in these ones, we kind of do. Or maybe we do, maybe if you assign an int to a float that it should, and it has, an implicit cast it can do. Maybe it should just do the implicit cast. But I feel less good about that compared to these. Ah, uh, but the fact they go through this stupid special magic function here, uh, it just feels like it's going to be hacky. Oh well, we will get there. We can stick some hacky stuff in if it improves the situation. We can add another ticket to just clean it up. Um, okay. <sighs> Test zero. Do, 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 do. Ew. What are these tabs doing here? Hate tabs. Right. Um, so, test zero, we have this. Let's get rid of this and get back to the original issue, which is inc increment f by this is going to have issues. Sure. 
Oh, right, the very original test case was this. That's fine. So, how's the best way we can tackle this? Well, also, I got distracted by this, didn't I? I wanted to know if this was valid at all. Um, so now I just want to add a little test case. The works Vario um, tests. I mean, if, it, if there is a bug, then we introduced it fairly recently. Because the last um, release of Keppel went through all the tests and didn't have any issues there. I don't know. Assignment test, let's just do it. Okay, assign nine. Do, 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 do. Let's do this. Let's see if we can drop this down, make it a simpler case. If we do this, does it get simpler? Whoops. Okay, yep, that's good. Um, that seems like a pretty simple version of this, so let's go and write it up as a test. Um, drop it down here. I think we can just take this bit and drop it in here. And change this to assign 10. Okay, and then we want to run 5 a.m. and we're going to see what happens. Okay, so there's one failure case for layered set zero. Um, this is some code that I haven't finished writing yet, so it makes sense that it's failing. I have a test in there that's to do with that um, on a branch. So that's okay. So apparently, assign 10 passed just fine. There it is. Interesting. And this is actually running, this is compiling. Okay, so the, the tests in Vario um, are just testing that compiler. But if you quick load Keppel test, it will also test all of these again, but also compiling them and ha handing that G GLSL off to um, GL itself. So then it will be compiled by Vario to get into GLSL and then compiled um, by GL so we can test that what the, the code that generated was actually valid. So apparently it's fine with that, but I'm glad we've got that test case in there, so that's good. Anyway, back to what we're meant to be doing, back to the snooker. Um, this fucker, and we can close this now. Okay, so let's go back to test zero, where we can get our issue, and then we'll press V here to jump to the frame that we're interested in. Um, And let's just do a quick and dirty version of this, which is, okay. How do we check if something can cast to the other thing? Um, well, I can't actually remember. Let's just go up here and do a grep for cast and see what comes up. Um, Oh look, V casts too. That sounds useful. Um, there, yeah, there's a function that takes. Some type to another type and that sounds great. Okay. Let's just do a really dirty version of this first. Let's go if um, GLSL op symbol um, is if it's equal to equals, then it has to be exactly the same. Otherwise, we're going to do a different assert. We're going to just assert that it casts. And so we need to be able to say that this, so the place is the one we're casting to, and we want to be able to cast from whatever the value being passed in is. So let's do that. 
Okay. Let's bring up the REPL again and do test zero, and now it works. Cool. So let's bring up Foo3 again, and let's go and test a few different versions of this. So, now if we do increment 2, oops, not like that, um, we can see that it's fine with it, plus equals 2, completely valid. Um, but if we set if to 2, it doesn't like it, which is good. Okay, so it's checking, but in the other cases, it allows casts. I kind of like that. Um, in, Lumi is saying, in GLSL and also C, statements can be wrapped in parens. In fact, they are expressions. Oh, okay. So this tells you that I, my, uh, my knowledge on C is casual, uh, unfortunately. I can write it, but I don't know the rules well. So a statement... So like a block can contain statements and expressions, or expressions also statements. Because those examples you're showing me, like A equals B equals C equals whatever, that, that I understand. I suppose they are expressions, aren't they? Because, yeah, the equality one, the assignment operators do return. Okay, so you can have... Yeah, that, that's complete... That's so obvious. Thank you. But, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Ban Chris from things. Ban, ban, ban. Right, okay, so... I'm actually kind of alright with that hack. If it's not a direct assignment... I mean, in that case, that, that um, special function is really designed just to generalize these few things. Um, I think I'm going to just go with this for now. And we will look at this more later. But we should add some tests for this. Let's go to assignment tests and um, make sure we, ha we cover these cases. So... Um, we should be able to compile. Let's um, <coughs> let's say a is zero of zero, um, and we want to say inc f a by two. This should now work. I know v is undefined. Go away. Just do that. Cool, that compiles. Then hopefully that wouldn't have compiled before. So that's oh, goodness sake. So let's do this. Um, if I did this, it used to complain that you can't do that from float to int, and now it's chill about it. So let's. That's okay. Good. That's what I expected. So this will finish. But we don't want um, this to succeed. We don't want it to change types on assignments. Um, And it should signal a specific error. So this should signal. Um, what's that thing called? Assignment. Uh, assignment type match. Okay. Right. And then we'll do 5 a.m. again, run all the tests. And we have a failure, which makes sense, but only one failure and 789 successes. So that's good. That's These are also in there running as well. So that is behaving like we want it to. Um, actually, what I could do with this special form, now I'm thinking about it, is um, add another argument, um, allow casting. And then we can just say if if, uh, whoops, not like that. If we allow casting, then just assert that it casts. Otherwise, check it. Um, and that means we're going to go and find all the places where this is used. 
So it should just be here, but let's um, scrap for it anyway. Okay, it's only in that file, that's good. Um, and modify place. So you get the op name, the GLSR name, the place, the, oh, oh yeah, the place and the value and T, I guess, like that. I think that should work. Oh, except in this case it's nil, isn't it? We just want to say don't allow casting here. Do allow casting. Here. Okay. So with that done, let's uh, go and run all the tests again. Yep, they all pass. Good. Nice. So that feels better. That feels a little less hacky. Nice. Um, and with that, let's commit it for now. Let's just say um, extend um, to allow um, casting of incoming value. This allows things like um, plus equals, minus equals, etc. to work. And we'll take this and we will jump up here. And we'll say it's fixed in this. Okay. Ah, but declarations like int a equals two aren't expressions. Good. Okay. So that's that's. Oh, in that case, that's definitely covered by. Yeah, that that's not going to be written like that by the compiler anyway. In fact, I'm very sure that yeah, t ex yeah, typed assignments. So where the type is at the beginning of the line, they definitely won't be in parens. Trash talk. How much documentation do you write for personal projects? It tends to be done in waves. I'm pretty bad at it in general, but then when I do, I try and I try and like allocate like a week that I know will just be suffering, and then I just do it. So um, if you let's just take RTG math for example, RTG math um, and Keppel, I suppose as well. Um, so RTG math, there should be a link to documentation here. And it's pretty extensively documented. Like, at least I try and provide reference documentation for everything. Um, so, yeah, there's quite a bit of that. Um, again, for Keppel, I, I did, when I last sat down to do it, um, you can find a, API documentation that's fairly extensive because uh, GL API is just confusing. So, I need all the help I can get. So, being able to get this just with, at a click of a button in Emacs is really nice. So yeah, I, I try and do a bunch, but I'm bad at it in general. It's just really hard to, like, because you know it's going to suck. So you have to go, okay, this next while is going to not be fun. And I can only do that every so often. Um, yeah. All right, okay, so that's, uh, that's this done, which is nice. Okay, when we find a hidden temp variable, where are we? Okay, we're an hour in. That's good. Um, yes, this one was exciting. Okay, so... Let's see if we can recreate this. So we're going to create a GPU struct, um, some vowels, and it's going to be uh, 
array is going to be an array of let's just do integers and we're going to have a hundred of them for some reason there we go hundred integers in a struct and then we're going to write a GPU function that uses this um, example zero is going to take actually let's just only have uniform arguments for now we'll worry about the rest of it later <coughs> um, it takes vowels, uh, which is the name of the argument. It's got a type of some vowels. I think we just put the um, type at the end, the uh, qualifier at the end. I'm just going to return any old vector four. And let's see what we can do. Example. Okay, yeah, that's a good point. Thanks. Okay, so I should have done the actually typed signature for this function, uh, which is just wrapping in parens. Okay, so we've got an SSBO here. I think, yeah, it's a buffer. And we are good to go. All right. So what we want to do, let's see what we were trying to do here. We were using with slots, and then we were trying to do an atomic add. Let's let's do that now. We'll say with slots. Um, we're going to get array out of vowels, and then we want to do an atomic add on the. Um, let's just see what the documentation is for this. Talking of documentation, um, yeah, atomic add. You went to you in fine. The place that the place that we're writing and the the value that we're adding. So it's going to be a ref of array 0, for example, and we're going to add 1. And when we did this, it compiled. Oh, god damn it, I know. OK, I'll just let me do this. Cool. Well, that's interesting. That looks fairly reasonable. What am I missing? That's interesting. I can't see the temp variable there that I was expecting it to create. And I'm not sure why it was able to elide that. Didn't think it was being that clever. So down here, I was expecting it to do a, make itself a little with slots variable. Do, do, do. So, like instance counts here. Oh, okay, right. So it had an array of structs, and then it was one of the structs from there it was trying to do. Okay, let's have a look at that then. Let's have a look. So, let's change this up a bit. Um, Data point um, is just going to be an integer. It's called foo, and then we're going to go and make an array. it's going to be an array of data points. And then what we're going to do is we're going to go and get um, this guy. We're going to say with slots um, foo. We're going to get it from that, and then we're going to add one to foo. So ask to access a struct foo on int. Oh yeah, whoops. Let's compile everything first. Oh, what's going on here? Compile this, compile this. Okay, what's it? The attempt to define GPU struct name some vowels failed as, while, oh, the layout thing is fun here. Whilst it was defined to have a default layout, the following slots had different layouts. Oh, okay, yeah, of course. So we actually should be defining these to be, um, to have layouts. I think that's done with STD430. I'm actually surprised it let me get this far without doing that. That's kind of questionable itself. Okay, fine, that compiled. Oh, 
Okay, so... Let's see what if we got something that's similar to this. Yes, okay. Okay, so now I need to find out what it was. In the following shader, this is kosher, but this is not. Um, as far as I know, it's because when we access this, we're actually taking the struct out of this array, which is, again, it's things are passed by value, so we're going to get a copy of the struct from this array. And then we're going to try and do an atomic add on it, which is not going to work, because atomic adds can only work on things that are inside the buffer. So, if this was um, this, it would have been fine. But as it is, it's a problem. So we kind of want to be able to... Um, have with slots understand this. So I, I would think it would be totally fine for this to fail if I had written this like um, uh, let array be um, slot value vowels um, like this. If I had done that, I would accept that's completely wrong. Um, or even if that was correct, yeah, if I had written, if I had written the bit where I did the a ref, so if I'd done, let's have a look. Like this, I'm explicitly saying, hey, look, I want to store this, I want to get something out of this array and I want to store it here. If I bind it to a variable, then I should expect that I'm getting a copy. But the way I wrote things here doesn't necessarily imply that, um, if with slots could do its job well. So yeah, that's the thing. That's the where I've got to work out, and that's going to involve looking into how this macro is written, um, or a special function, probably, in Vario. Okay, so... Who need dogs anyway? Yes. <laughs> Given the number of times on the stream, I'm like, I don't remember how this API works. I think I need more dogs. Um, indeed, Zulu. I agree. Okay, so let's go and find out if this is something we can fix relatively easily or if it's going to be a massive pain in the butt. Uh, let's comment this out for now. And then off we go to... CL land. Um, maybe it's in here. Let's just grep with slots. There it is, slots. Okay, yes. So what it does is it defines a a let. And this is the problem. It's making a let to store the value it gets out of slot value. And then it um Yeah, so it's it's writing ooh, wait a second though. So it does do a simple macro let, which is what you expect. Okay, so yes, it's writing the I'm just seeing if I'm getting this right here. Yes, okay, so this is going to be where the temporary value is. <coughs> Dear me. Um, this is where we're getting the problem. We're taking the form, which in this case is our array lookup, and we're putting the value into this temporary variable. And by doing it, we're breaking that connection uh, with the SBR. We're writing the value somewhere. When we really just wanted to be able to say, hey look, I just want this slot. 
um, and I want to use it here. I wonder what information we can get when we arrive there. Like, can we tell that we're getting it from an SSBO? And, well, more than that, actually, if if we've just if we've got a, I don't know. Let's have a look. Let's just stick a break here and see what information we have. Break. Ooh. And um, we'll just dump a whole bunch of information in here. So we'll do slots and form and bindings, maybe? Should we do bindings as well? Sure, why not? Um, and then bring up the REPL and let's just do an example. No, let's... Fine then. Foo three. Boop. Doop. There we go. So there's our foo. We tap C, we bring up all our things that were passed in. Okay, so we don't really have much here, which is kind of annoying. Um Yeah, we really are just in a macro, aren't we? There isn't much to see here. Annoying, okay. So yeah, we don't even have any information about form. Um, oof. Trying to think. I mean, we could turn this into a special function and then try and look at it. Um, this is so tidy as it is right now. It's such a shame. Um, but I think that might be the way to go. Because what I'm going to want to do is look at this. Once it's once it's been compiled, I want to look at this thing and see if there's anything in there that we can use um, that will be helpful. So I'm just going to grab this and we're going to rip it apart. So... Um, do, 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 do. We are going to, how does this work? Let's do slots form and body. Um, we are going to compile form form. That's the one we're really interested in. Um, and then we're going to have some useful stuff. And then right at the end, we're going to have to return. Well, let's just do the same thing we were doing here, hopefully. So we'll pass in the environment we got back from compiling form. And we'll pass it into here, where it's going to be used for the rest of the compilation. Um, let's just... I do not know what most of this is, so let's uh, let's break it down. Let's take this, let's show it here. Um, what happens if I compile this? Ah, fuck. Do 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 do. Oh yeah, uh, we don't call it at body here, we just use at rest. Um, variable accessor is defined but never used. Is it not? Oh yeah, um, we've got something really fucky going on here. How did I cock that up? Oh yeah, that's what were you doing, Chris? Okay, right, let's let's try this again. These two are gonna be here. Um slot name which came from somewhere nope 
Oh, that must have been from the old code. Yeah, sure. Let's do this. Okay, we've got some things that define but never used. Sure, let, let's go with that. But, oh, fucking hell. What's wrong with this? Oh, fuck again. Yeah, this is the new thing for with slots. Right. Does anything work anymore? Um, who knows? This is hacky as hell. Okay. So, is there anything we can do just to... Let's just throw some crap in here. Jam equals one. Excellent. Jam is one. Um, and let's do this. And pull example. And we can see jam is one in there. Hooray! Jam one. That means it's using this code. That's all I wanted to see. Cool. Right. We're there. So we've turned this lovely macro we had into this horrible um, special function. But the thing is, at this point, we've already compiled the form, which is the thing coming in. And so we have some information on it. So now I want to do this break again. But this time, we're going to have much more information. So form um, and int type, they're the most interesting things. Um, and I'm going to actually not do that. I'm going to say inst environment as well. And now, yes. Now I've got a lot more things. So we have... I'm going to just get rid of this. Come back here. Okay, so the compiled form is whatever this is. Or is this the type? Okay, so this is the, this seems to be the object, I think. So yeah, this is the first one. This is, the, oh no, this is inst type. Okay, yeah. Oh, we haven't got inst obj. Okay, right, I need to, I need to redo this test again because I definitely want to see that. Um, inst object, which is the compiled object, and then we've got the type of the object, and then we've got the environment. Sure, let's do that. Bam. C to bring up the data that was in the arguments passed a format. Okay, so here we go. This is the thing that was compiled. Um, it is a block struct. Okay, so that's interesting. There's this thing that's saying, that's holding information about the place. So it's vowels and it is just a V value. Okay. So I wonder, I wonder what I'm able to do with this because this is really interesting. So this will be for the first one for array, right? Yeah, so vowels, this is, we're doing this one currently. I want, I'm really interested in this one more. So what I might do, let's rewrite this so I can uh, only have to deal with the interesting one. Um, let's do slot value um, vowels. Cool, right. And get rid of this line and compile. Really? Boo. That's disturbing in itself because it's definitely meant to be there. Oh, yeah, yeah slot value doesn't have to be quoted in, in Varia. Okay, there we go. Okay, so this is a ref of the slot value of this thing. So let's look at the compiled stuff. The place tree is a little different this time. It's showing that we're getting a value and then we're using um, the accessor function on it some vowels ARR, which is getting the array, and then we're running AREF on it. So if we were able to look at this tree and ascertain some quality about that value um, that could tell us, hey, don't just stick this in a temporary variable, then that would be really useful. Um, we basically need to think of a counterpoint. When do we want to store in a temporary variable? And I'm not so sure about that yet, but there's something here and I'm just not sure what it is. These are the types that we used. Sure, that makes sense. Yeah. This is the current um, type of the expression, which is the data point. That makes sense because that's what we're getting out of. When we're doing AREF, we're gonna be getting AREF from here and we're gonna be getting one instance of that. 
So I think it's something about this. Oh yeah, and there's the GLSL expression that we're that we're running with. It's gonna be something about this place tree, I'm pretty sure. Place tree is not a, a proper term in Lisp either. It's just something I cooked up for this compiler where I was just dealing with shit. Okay. Um, oh, Zulu is saying, today I learned that break takes in a formatting string. And it's so useful. Okay, we're, we're going to talk about that right now because it's fucking great. Okay, so... Because some of this... This is just absolutely essential for me when doing any work in Lisp. So let's make a blah function and it takes an obj and then we're going to say uh, break and oh look and then we can pass in some things and in this case we're going to do that thing. We're just going to pass in uh, one of the objects and then we're going to turn obj because we've done something with it. All right, the important thing here for me at least is that when you run this, yes we get here and we can um, go in and we can check out the stack just like normal, we can press V to jump to definition. But the big one that I absolutely love, I'm not sure what it's technically called, so let's just look it up. Um, inspect signaled condition. Um, I think that's the one. No, yeah, uh, yeah, it must be actually. Yeah, that must be the one I'm using. So yeah, you hold down shift, hit C, and this gives you the things that were passed. Um, to break. Uh, so this is, a, I've probably done it the most boring example I possibly could. So I'll listen bored out of that. Um, oh yeah, because I didn't pass in the right number of arguments. Okay. <laughs> that was fucking stupid. Uh, yes, yeah, just do make array 10. Um, so now when we hit C, um, we can see that we get the arguments that were passed to the format, the that were passed to break itself. Uh, this also works for error or warn or things like this. So we can hit return here and we can go and inspect those. So not only do we get this nice string that tells us something, but it also comes along for free with all the data that was actually passed in. Really handy. Um, also handy because unless you've told your function like um, declare um, optimize for debug, um, odds are that your compiler is going to remove some stuff that isn't being used, or if it's able to fold something away, it might not be available in the um, in the stack in the actual um, yeah in the stack trace. If we go in here, we might not see some of the variables. <coughs> so by passing them to break, we guarantee that they're going to be used by something, which means they're not going to get ripped out and stuff like this. So it can be really handy for that kind of stuff. You get to see the value regardless. It's dope. Um, Uh, let me say, I've been reading through the repo a bit and I'm really impressed at how good the documentation is. Oh yeah, like a VDEF special is, is missing docs. It is, uh, actually, is Vario documented at all? Did I actually do that? Maybe I did. Oh, I've got, I've got vague memories of that being an absolute pain in the ass, so maybe I did. Holy shit, would you look at that? There's a user guide. There's reference documentation and a user guide? Bloody hell, Chris. Yeah, there's like stuff in here. Okay. Bloody hell. Oh yeah, so I guess VDEF special. Have I actually... Yeah, so I actually don't think I've said... I've like put the... Have I put VDEF special in the public API? I'm not even sure. I know I use it a lot inside the compiler. But you don't normally define extra special forms in the language. You would normally use macros and functions. They're the kind of API, presenting the same kind of API as you would get in CL. So that might just be, hey, you're not meant to be using that kind of thing. But I'm not sure. I can't really remember. Okay. So anyway, yeah, break is amazing. Um, or just being able to get the arguments to format is amazing. Super useful. Yeah, it makes debugging way better. Anywho, let's do it again. Get here. 
Is there anything in the type that might be useful? Not really. Lists of slots. Class information, all kinds of crap. No, that's fine. Yes, it's this. Oh yeah, another another one if you're new to this kind of stuff. If you hold down Alt and hit Return while you're on a value, it kicks it down to the REPL, which is really handy. Um, because then you can shove it in a temporary value and if you can carry on testing using the actual value that caused an issue. That's great. So we're going to stick around with this um, because it's interesting. So when do we want to... When do we want to not stick something in a temporary variable? I guess when the initial thing is an SSBO and hmm, I'm not sure what the qualification would be. The kind of we kind of just want to say if you are just accessing. Fields or array elements, maybe. So then we just say if it's an accessor or for the struct, or if it's a ref, then we just are going to be cool with it. And instead of having a let here, what we'll actually replace it with is another symbol, mangro like a symbol macro let, or we just shove it in here, to be honest. We just replace um, name here with the entire form. It's something that's got to be something that's side effect free as well. That might be something we can check actually. Um, pure nil. Oh no! Why is it not pure? Should be pure. I wonder what about it is not pure. None of those things should have had any side effects, so why? I think I also added a break in Vari. I did. There we go. Um, oh, and I can see the compiled object. This is handy. And I love it when I help myself out. Okay. So, so far, it's pure. Good. What, what do we add next? If we do slot value... It's considered not pure. Okay, so that's just a bug in slot value. There shouldn't be anything about using slot value that makes it impure unless it's a set f of a slot value. So let's just look at slots. In fact, we're already here. Um, slot value. Da -da 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 -da. That might be it. It might be the fact that slot value doesn't know if it's being assigned to or not from this current place. Actually, should it matter? Oh, this is just down to crappy things about how Vari works, for Vario works, as opposed to how things are normally done in CL. I mean, everything in this is just hacked together by me, kind of as I go. Um, see, so yes. Let's go have a look at one of these structs and see how these um, accesses are defined. Um, okay. Vario. 
Okay, so it's this V def struct here that's of interest. So let's go and take that and um, dump it here. And we'll expand this and see what that expands into. Define var struct, and it comes into this. And this is the thing of interest. Um, seeing as I was looking at this one, I'm actually going to do this. Where is it? Oh, fuck it. I'll just do it from here. Okay. There's the bit I was actually interested in here. Okay, so oh, wait a second. The accessor function itself can be pure. That's no problem. It's the um, setf is what should be the thing that says, "Oh, now it's impure." I think we can just tell vdefstruct that it needs to just put pure on all of these. Yeah, let's try that. I think that's what we're going to go with, and then we'll see how that where that takes us. Okay. Um, let's see what's been going on in chat, because I am behind. Sorry about that. The naming seems to hint at being able to check that value for conditional breakpoints. Um... Zulu saying, Lady Hell had no idea that inspect signal condition was a thing. I, neither did I for fucking ages. And it's so good. It completely, like, massive improvements to my daily programming. Oh, it's so good. Um, Lumi, when you were saying about, uh, seems to hint at being able to check for value, uh, value conditional breakpoints. That bit, I'm not sure what you're referring to, but I'm really interested. So if you would mind, wouldn't mind expanding on that, I'd love to hear. Um... Compiler removes things. Yeah, exactly. That's why I either add an optimized debug, a cheapo format string, or just prior to the break. Yeah. Yeah, it's just... Oh, man. It's just so good. Um, Lumi's pointing out the... Uh, the docs. <laughs> good job past me, yeah. Badges? I have nothing to do with them. How dare they? Except my logo. Um, I usually have a hard time to debug when a function is getting called a lot of times. It would be nice if you could collect all the data from breaking multiple calls. <laughs> yeah, it would. You could probably invent something for that. Yeah, it's kind of interesting. I'm trying to, like, I'm asking my brain, oh, what would be a good way of doing that? And at the moment, it's just kind of, like, fucking whistling at me. There's nothing. So, oh, well. Uh, but, yeah, I mean, you could you could push that data out to, like, a hash table. I mean, because you want to be able to look up different breakpoints, right? You can have multiple of them in there. So you need to be able to pick which breakpoint to return data from. Um, yeah, so I'm not sure if you put a name on the breakpoint or if you use some other key. What would be really nice is if you could grab like the code position or something like this or the function it was within, but you don't really have that information. It's a bit of a bummer. Um, Trash Doc saying, I need to really need to read through the slime SBL feature list because I barely know any of these tricks. Oh, it's so good. Um, again, for slime, just remember, if you're in Emacs at any point, if you do Control H and then hit M, it will give you information on your current mode. And there's a lot of things in here. So when we go down to find, um, let's just go and look for slime. Just skimming through here and looking up a few things that might be of interest um, can really help. Like finding out uh, jumping to definition and jumping back and all that kind of stuff. Uh, finding out who calls things or who binds things and all this kind of stuff. To be honest, who calls is always the best. I haven't had as much luck with everything else. But yeah, like, um, there's quite a bit in here. It's neat. Slime is a cool thing. Um, 
Yeah, Sly has stickers, um, which is able to compound data from multiple cores. That is true. That is very cool as well. Um, Sly, yeah, Sly has some really neat stuff. I haven't I haven't switched over, but it's pretty good. Also lets you replay stickers, which is really powerful. That, I don't know what that means, but that does sound interesting. That said, I want conditional breakpoints so bad, I'm meaning to get around to implementing them, but life, yep. Sounds interesting. I think Clojure has a tap function which sends stuff to a handler. Like, yeah, I mean, I guess there's enough things out there already that you could borrow ideas from. Um, I've recently moved to Sly from Slime, but my use isn't at parity yet. Yeah, that would take a while. Control HB for all the bindings. Thank you. Yeah, the help stuff in Emacs is, oh, it, it it's it works. I mean, it, it's it takes a while to to get used to using it, but it's there. Right, I think I'm just gonna um, uh, go and fill up my drinks, and I will be back in just a second. Let's see if I can hit the right button to say I'm coming back. All right, that's better. Being ill is stupid. Don't do it. It's a bad hobby. Okay, so... Where did we get to? I'm like on a complete blank at the moment. Um, so... Structs and purity and accesses. Okay, so... If we go to Deathstruct G, which is actually renamed these days, is it? No, okay. Let's go to... What's the... Um, Not you. Where's the actual one we're interested? Yes, V def struct. It's actually defined vari struct. I really need to update <laughs> all of Vario to actually use the non-deprecated macros. Um, but yeah, let's look for the um, thing that generates all of the accesses. Make struct accesses. There we go. And we just go here and say pure T. There we go. Okay, right, now let's go into this and go in here, in here, in here. And it's now pure. Excellent. That's better. Um, And now let's do the full AREF thing and make sure that itself is also pure. So we're going to do something along the lines of, we want to know, hey, if this expression is pure, if the value that is being accessed right at the end of the chain is an SSBO, and if, um, what else? What else? Um, if the functions in between are only struct accesses and or a ref then we don't want to assign this to a temporary value this is kind of, this is hacky obviously but it's practical hacky i think this is something that's still worth doing 
Because it does make the code considerably cleaner. Ah, Bepis. Right. Um, pure nil. Oh no. Why? Aref isn't pure? That's interesting. Well, first off, you. Um, but all of these things, it should be, though. Look at this guy down here. Okay, so what we want to do is we want to take, we want to look at the two expressions uh, that are passed to AREF, the array itself and the index. And we need to look at, make sure that they're both pure. If they're both already pure, if there's no side effects in either of them, then AREF itself doesn't introduce side effects. Ah, maybe that's the point. Maybe we can't just say that the Accessors are. This is something I need to find out. How dumb is this system? <laughs> like, yeah, I'll need to see how it resolves the pure stuff. That's interesting. Okay, so let's just break here. Let's see how things work. Break. Blurg. Um, yep. And we are looking at. Index, either of them really doesn't matter. Um, really? Getting straight to foo? It means we're getting to with slots, somehow we're not getting to without doing things in AREF. That's interesting. Um, oh, right, no, this is AREF handling uh, block arrays, which is something else. We won't worry about that for now. Okay, so what happens? Oh, I shudder to think about how dumb this is gonna be. Um, let's bring this back, abort that, bring it here. Let's go and inspect this value and it is not pure for some reason um, is it because I didn't compile all this stuff it might have been it probably is the one thing I wish you could do is just jump right into the format arguments um, themselves rather than just inspecting the format itself uh, okay so pure is T now but what if we do something gross, right? So let's um, let's check something obvious. So let's blah is zero, and then we're going to say set f blah is one, right? We're going to go inspect that and just make sure that this is not pure. Nil. Hooray! Good. Um, Right, so we, what we could do is we can put this here, whoops, and then one will be the index that's used into this AREF, right? But this should also be, this is where I think something stupid is going to be done. Yeah, this thinks it's pure even though one of the arguments clearly has had a side effect. Um, so it's not safe to use this expression in this way. So, 
That's dumb. And where else is this dumbness propagated? Um, so really it should be that when a function says that it itself is pure, um, we need to then just, we need to consolidate what its arguments have said. Special forms should just be allowed to handle purity themselves. It's up to them to actually take care of that properly. But, um, function calls, hmm. If we're going to say the whole expression is pure, then that's incorrect in this case. I'm not sure how that was meant to be handled, but I'm going to have to look into how functions are compiled. Interesting. Seeing a discussion here on debuggers and things like this. Um, when I said the things about conditional breakpoints earlier, I was referring to the word condition um, to be specified in the debugger and not the code. Yes. Yeah. Okay. It's funny, even though, though, though those are in Visual Studio, I never end up using them because they're so much slower. And I don't know exactly why, but I always end up having to put the conditional in the code if it's been... If it's even called vaguely frequently, things get so slow. Um, conditional breakpoints in closure. That's cool. Oh, neat. So you do it as a kind of little reader macro thing. That's kind of cool. Uh, Zulu in is saying I'm spoiled by Visual Studio and it's awesome debugger. Totally. Yeah, that's really handy. It's the one bit. It's the one thing I use Visual Studio for is the debugger. Everything else is. Massive pain in the butt, but god damn that debugger. Um, where else is this dumbness propagated? Yes, that is the, the quote of the day. Uh, do you assign purity to standard library functions? Yes, actually, if you go to... Um, if you go to GLSL spec and look at functions.lisp... Um, there will be a lot of functions um, and you'll be able to see that you can specify pure at the end of them there. So that was done in a semi-automated but somewhat by hand <laughs> way. Yeah. AK Krems says, I'm trying out Sly now. Anyone know how to use IV for completion? Oh, cool. Yeah, I should really look at inline like fucking completion and stuff like this. I haven't touched it in ages because it always felt really goddamn slow. There's one thing I just can't accept is when it slows down the typing experience, it's just... Ugh, I have to deal with that all day for um, OmniSharp and things like that. And it's just... It is not acceptable. But it's all I've got right now. All right, let's go for a little look. Um, there might be very good reasons I shouldn't be doing this, but at the same time, meh. Um, let's look at compile fun call. Um, let's look at compile form first, actually, just to see what's going on in there. That should be the dispatch. Yeah, compiles symbol, compile list form, um, compile, yeah, that's where it's going to be most of them. Compile fun call form, compile call form, things like this. Expanding macros. Um, handling specific functions. Power call with single function. We have these uh, interesting cases where if you in Vari, if you say something like um, sign Maybe probably signs a bad example, or mod or something like this. Let's have a look. Right, see how mod has loads of overloads? So if you write this, it's referring to every one of these. Um, and then when you do a fun call, we have to pick which one you meant by based on the type of the argument. So we defer that decision. You can also specify um, like mod like this. So 
vec4, vec4, and that will refer to exactly this overload. Um, but yeah, if you just say this, then we don't know which one you're talking about until later. So Vario tries to handle that, but it's not always great at it. But it adds a lot of complications to this stuff. Um, but we are interested in... Compile function call. That's probably going to be the one. Compile regular function call. Okay, yes, yeah, so this is trying to find out if the function itself says it's pure. But that's not the only thing. We kind of want to say and. Um, all of the arguments were pure. Um, so let's just take a quick stop here uh, and look at args. I'm hoping these are the... Um, yeah, there we go. Yes, it's just a list of compiled objects. That's excellent. That's what we want. Um, and then we should be able to go into these and see if they are pure, which we can. So that's great. That's what we want to do. Um, there's a difference, though, between... Yeah, we're going to have to see how this works. Pure and pure funk and... Um, Every pure p args. Let's try that and see how it breaks. Oops. Ah, fuck you. Um, this will be breaking things. I'm, I'm thinking of certain cases with um, these kinds of functions. I, well, I think it's going to be breaking things. Okay, let's go and look at this. Pure is nil. Fair enough. Um, and the, we're going to have to find out why. Uh, because that one I'd kind of hoped would be fine. So, where are we calculating this? So, let's do this. Let's go um, break compile. Um, this and then this and then this so it's going to be the function and then the args and then this chap oh no um. <sighs> oh that says it's true Wait a second, which function are we compiling? Oh yeah, we're comp compiling some some vowels R, which is fine. Um, let's say continue. Uh, Aref is saying nil. That makes sense. Okay, let's go and have a look at why. Um, so we look at the function Aref and it says that it itself is pure, so that should be fine. So it's gotta be one of these two that is considered not pure. So the first one's fine, so it's saying that the index nil is not pure. Um, oh wait, are we correct? Of course we're correct. We stuck on fucking set f there. That's dumb. Um, so there's a couple of things here. Let's do this. So continue, then there's our a ref, and now pure is t. Okay, so this is now considered a pure expression. Grand. Um, what time are we at? 49. Okay, we're not going to get this finished, but we can still get a little bit further. Um, this can be something I hopefully... Say, maybe I'll get some time to finish this in my free time. Probably not at the moment. One of the things is because I've been ill, I am behind on where I wanted to be on Tailspire stuff. So I'm trying to just catch up with that at the moment. And it's some really fundamental kind of data model stuff 
Um, yeah, it's interesting. I'm thinking of another case that this might be really stupid, and so I want to check this out. If we do, um, if we do this. Oops. Good. Okay, that's correct. Fine. I was worried that because this express expression itself is not pure, that then when we tried to read this over here, it was going to say that this isn't pure. Um, so, okay, that's not entirely stupid, but it's, it's dumb enough, but it's not so dumb. Okay, so uh, we've made a little bit of progress. So now we get some information um, about purity that's a little better than it was. So we're here. Oh, uh, we're going to have to go back and remove this crap. And we've only done this so far for regular function calls, which are ones from, like, okay, so this is some internals to Vario crap, but um, this is a function defined using... Um, defined like this, these template functions, really, and things from the spec. Um special functions and external functions which are the ones that users define those are handled separately and they will have their own rules um, so i'm not going to worry about those for now special functions it's up to the special function to decide because that's what a special function is for it takes control of everything and um, for external functions those are just lots of lisp expressions so that should resolve to the correct answer anyway so in fact we might have got it okay so what's what's next um, let's have a think. Okay, so back in our little land of nonsense over in, where are we? Slots, here we go. Um, in this, foo! Okay, so now we should be able to go to this compiled object and it says, hooray, this is pure and also if we went into the place tree and we went to the last item and we had a look at it, we could see that it comes from a block struct and we can see that it is, hopefully, I would like some information on it. Um, I would really like to know that it's from an SSBO, and I'm not sure how to tell that yet. Hmm. Okay, so that's going to have to be something to think about. Yeah. Maybe we can get it from somewhere else. Let's have a look. Um, in fact, it's an ephemeral type. Maybe I can use that. I'm not sure if that's the best. Yeah, maybe that's not a terrible idea, actually. So there are, there are types that can't be represented um, in GLSL, but Vario does support, um, and they have to be compiled to something else. Um, one of those kinds of things is an ephemeral type. Um, this is getting around the fact that just to do with the way that we want to treat um, SSBO blocks like they are variables and they're really not. Um, so there's some some logic back there for handling that. Maybe that's what I do. I don't know. I'd have to have a look. But basically, I'm going to have to get into this and go to the last one and look at something about this that tells us, okay, we want to try and do this funky version where we um, we don't bind to a temporary variable um, and we instead inline the expression in every place it's used. Which is normally not something when... Ooh, shit. That, this might actually be a bad idea. No. No, like we're checking for purity to begin with. Okay, because I was thinking of this being evaluated a number of times and the side effects of that. But 
That's fine. Let's have a look. Um, doot, doot, doot. Discussions on why Emacs stuff is slow. Um, so you're saying I use company with zero delay and find it helpful. Um, used to use company, but Ivy also does all Emacs uh, mini buffering. Oh, I hate that so much. I hate. I, I I really want something that only 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 does auto completion in this one place and opt in. Like I just want to say, okay, in Emac in like common Lisp dev, I want to use this one thing. But I hate it when they go and fucking change everything else. Oh, it makes me so mad. Um, sorry for just ranting over something you like, but. <laughs> It does not work for me. Um, yeah, things being slow. Shin saying the problem isn't that is is ah isn't the elisp isn't concurrent. It's elisp is slow. That is very true. Yeah, Shin saying we had IDs with fast completion of thousands of symbols long before parallelism came became a thing. Yeah, it's just it is slow. I use company and helm. I spent too long configuring Emacs, so I just don't want to touch it again if I can avoid it. Yeah, I, I get that feeling. That's why like, I never end up doing this, because I just, like, yeah, it pops up the buffer. It's kind of, it's, it's a little bit annoying, but I'm so used to it. But it is janky. Um, and it, it would actually be better for the stream if it didn't pop up a buffer, because it's one of those things that I push around and out the way very quickly, but it creates a lot of visual noise for people watching. Um, yeah. Saying company mode uh, is using cooperative concurrency here, although nothing multi-threaded related, of course. Elisp just being slow is, is a contributing factor, yeah. I just don't want that pause when I'm typing. Like, I don't mind it taking a while to come back with the answer, but if it causes the cursor to lag as I'm typing, it's just, ugh, everything goes to hell. Um... Trash Talk saying, how much freedom do you get with choosing an ID editor from a company? It really depends on the nature of the company. Like, obviously in my current job, we, it's just a tiny group, so it's like there's only two of us coding, so we just pick whatever the hell we like. Um, in my last job, we were, a we were in a startup, and it was getting towards kind of medium size. We were getting to up towards 30 people, but most of them, I suppose about a third were kind of developers or third to a half and even at that point we're just i mean it was a it was it was started by developers so id was never forced on anyone um yeah ak graham saying it's optional though you have to opt in to get it everywhere okay you were saying that was ivy that um is opt-in okay that's cool as long as it's opt-in to start with, because it, it's some of them just do it immediately, and then it's like I can't navigate to fix anything because now you've just changed how the mini buffer works, and all of my muscle memory's fucked. Um, Akergram saying I should suggest you. Um, Look at the my IVCL complete a point function I linked. Oh, stuff that's been linked. Where was it? A kick ram. Nice. Thank you, sir. I will definitely check that out. If I just hook that up to whatever I'm using at the moment to auto complete, then I don't need. See, this is the thing. I don't even know what I do. I think I can. Do I control tab or something like that? Control C tab. Good question. Yeah, I do control C tab. So if I just change control C tab to whatever that is. Um, that would probably be very nice. Okay, I'll give that a try. Shamira saying some companies don't let you install anything at all or use your own tools because of oh yeah, fuck that. Fuck them. 
Like, unless you really need the money. <laughs> Try to find somewhere else. Um, that's great, Cram. Thank you. I will try that out. Well, I hope I try it out. Anyway, it's been a very long time since a company has forced a tool set onto me. Yeah, I mean, there's only like, I think you force team orchestration tools. So one of the things that we, obviously, it was like version control system. Obviously, everyone has to be on the same one. So we were using Git. Um, editor config was mandatory, but that works in every goddamn editor anyway. So it really isn't a big deal. But it orchestrated, you know, formatting. For the most part. Or at least the basic stuff. The settings for your editor. Uh, there wasn't a whole lot on top of that. You know. Communications mediums. I suppose that would be the thing. You want to standardize some things there. Editor con figures a saver in teams. Yes it is. It's so good. Get that shit in early into a project. Anyway. Um, oh it's gone 2300. Well okay. So. I should go. But I should hack around with this some more and see where I get to with Wiz slots. I don't think it's going to be that much more. I'll probably do a limited version where we go, hey, if the root variable is um, an ephemeral type and a few other things I can check, then don't create the temporary variable. Instead, just use the expression. Um, and we'll see how that goes. I'll need to run the test as well to see if we've broken anything, because I expect we will have somewhere in here. Um, whoops. Yeah, where is it? 5 a.m. Run all the tests. Oh, yeah, our breakpoint. Idiot. Um, okay, so we haven't broken anything yet. Well, anything we... We haven't broken any of the tests yet. We might have broken plenty of things we haven't tested. Anyway, so... Thank you so much for stopping by. Um, we'll try and get back to some graphic stuff again soon. Um, I still need to go through the code and uh, look at that compute shader and try and understand it some more. But yeah, there, we're, um, we're getting some good progress there. So it'd be nice to get back to that. I've just set YouTube before the stream, trimming the other videos, uh, the last two episodes. So yeah, I'll, um, I'll get those online ASAP. Also, do you think I should put this one on YouTube? I mean, is this worth going on? I suppose it's not as bad as some of them have been, so I could do that. Um, and other than that, thanks for uh, thanks for stopping by. And yeah, YouTube. Okay, it'll go on YouTube. All right, thanks a lot, folks. Catch you next time. Peace.